So this episode marks our one year anniversary for Audible Bleeding. We've published 35 episodes so far featuring over 35 vascular surgeons. We have almost 40,000 unique downloads. And we've developed collaborations with the JVS and the SVS Young Surgeons Committee. But next year we have even more exciting content for you with more collaborations and support with the vascular community. And we're gonna focus more on our educational initiatives for board review and innovative ways to bring you the most up-to-date and impactful literature in vascular surgery. We've also been humbled and impressed by the donations from our listeners, and we'll use this money to make the podcast even better. We hope you enjoy the interview with a familiar voice to Audible Bleeding. Enjoy. This is Audible Bleeding, the vascular surgery podcast. We're here to help you keep your finger on the pulse. I'm Adam Johnson here with Drs. Uh, Sharif Alozi and Jacob Schwartzman, and we have the honor of having Dr. Frank Veith with us on the podcast today. He's a professor of surgery at the Cleveland Clinic Lerner College of Medicine and the New York University Medical Center and is the William J. Von Liebberg Chair in Vascular Surgery at the Cleveland Clinic Foundation. He is widely recognized as a thought leader in vascular surgery with two numerous to count awards, publications, and leadership positions, including the past chairman of the American Board of Vascular Surgery and was the 50th president of the Society for Vascular Surgery. But most notably, he was the first guest on the Vascular Surgery podcast, Audible Bleeding. Welcome back to the show, Dr. Veith. Well, Adam and Jake, it's a pleasure to be uh, with you again. So just as a brief update and overview, what have you been up to over the past year uh, since you were last with us on Audible Bleeding? Well, my main occupation, I guess, either fortunately or unfortunately for the last couple of years has been uh, dealing with the challenge of making up our program for the symposium every November uh, and then dealing with the administrative and other issues, many of them rather mundane, that come up with running a big meeting. What do you think has been the most exciting or interesting to happen in vascular surgery over this past year, 2019? I had the opportunity to look at our program for this year's meeting, which is from the 19th through the or 23rd of November at the Hilton. The program is really very exciting for me. I, I want to hear all the talks, and it's hard to pick out areas that are highlights because so many of them and so many of the talks are going to be very interesting. Of course, the controversy, I call it sometimes a witch hunt about uh, the impact of paclitaxel coated devices on um, mortality. That whole area is, is very interesting. We can talk a little bit about that. There's going to be some new stuff at our meeting, which tend to contradict the mortality signal that the Katsanos article came up with. I think that particular area, which is of great interest because of the industry support of uh, paclitaxel coated devices and their effectiveness, I think that topic has been overplayed a little bit and that I don't think it's going to change our practice very much if indeed the mortality signal is real, which I don't believe that it is. I think it's a a statistical quirk, but that still remains to be seen. That's obviously a hot area. That The other area that I think is really very exciting is all the advances in dealing with lower extremity occlusive disease. Most of these advances, of course, are endovascular, and whether or not some of them work or don't work remains to be seen, but there's a lot of interesting stuff in that area, and I think more and more it will go to endovascular treatments, but I think there's still going to be a significant role, probably around 25% of patients who have critical limb ischemia will at some point in their course need an open procedure. That's a very hot area. And then, of course, all the hubbub about fenestrated and branched endovascular grafts for treating complex aneurysms. That's an exciting area. Medical treatment is a very exciting area. I think it's being underplayed by most vascular specialty organizations because it really doesn't require procedures, but I think it's a very exciting 
way to treat most, if not all, patients with vascular disease related to arteriosclerosis. And then, of course, the whole buzz and excitement about TCAR as a way of improving results with carotid stenting, which has always been a little worse than carotid endarterectomy, whether it be in the randomized trials or the population-based studies, I, I think TCAR is going to make a difference and add to the equality of carotid standing in many patients, equality with carotid endarterectomy. So those are the, I think, some of the hot areas, but all the areas are hot. And then there are the political or semi-political issues like the NICE guidelines for which patients should have EVAR versus open repair. There's a lot of good new stuff on EVAR for ruptured aneurysms. There are a lot of hot items in, in vascular surgery, and hopefully our meeting will clarify uh, some of these. Thank you very much for that, Dr. Veith. Uh, it's very helpful for someone like me, a trainee who's only rising through the ranks to hear your opinion on some of these things. And you've been a uh, major proponent of the endovascular revolution since the very beginning. In your 1996 SVS presidential address entitled Charles Darwin in Vascular Surgery, you likened medical specialties to species and talked of the need to evolve in order to survive. What are some of your recommendations for the specialties at that time and at this time? What are the recommendations for our specialty to survive at this time? As you know, we're in competition with both interventional radiology and interventional cardiology for providing treatment for most of our vascular patients. And this competition is particularly strong with the interventional cardiologists who are very talented individuals. Uh, they're smart, they're technically adept, and so forth. And I think the best way for us to deal with this competitive nature of our field, and that is uh, us as vascular surgeons competing with interventional cardiologists, is for us as vascular surgeons and our specialty to be as strong as possible. We're never going to stop the cardiologists uh, and radiologists from doing the procedures that they do. They're really our colleagues and partners in treating vascular disease. So we as a specialty vascular surgery, in order to survive in this competitive environment, have to remain as strong and vibrant as we possibly can in order to compete effectively and to use our assets which is the ability to do open surgery uh, and provide total care for vascular patients, to use these assets to maintain a competitive advantage or status in this crowded non-cardiac vascular disease field. You know, Dr. Veith, I, I actually read your talk from 1996, your presidential address, and I think it's interesting for people maybe to get a little perspective. So at the time, you had three recommendations for vascular surgery. Maybe you can elaborate those on a little bit on what your perspective was then, and in hindsight, which of those recommendations you think panned out. Would you be able to do that for us? Yeah, that's a great question. At the time, we were fortunate to be involved in some of the early endograph work and the remarkable effectiveness of endografts, these very primitive ones that we made ourselves, gave me insight into the fact that vascular surgery was going to change and that I predicted that 40 to 70 percent of the lesions we were then treating, this was back in the mid and late 90s, would ultimately be best treated by endovascular techniques, be they endografts, uh, stents, uh, balloon angioplasties, etc. And that insight made me make these three recommendations. And of course, it was based on my experience. I learned from interventional radiologists because I was really uneducated in endovascular techniques. And I and Mike Marin, uh, who was my partner in this effort, we both learned from interventional specialists, primarily interventional radiologists. So I made three recommendations. One was that we all work in multi-specialty centers with vascular surgeons, cardiologists, and radiologists working together, separate from general surgery and general radiology. 
I thought that that would allow us to educate each other in our strengths and ultimately was the best way for treating patients. The patients would be the ultimate beneficiaries, but we would also benefit because we would be able to learn each other's assets in this endovascular revolution. And that I thought was a kumbaya recommendation. It never really worked except in a few, very few exceptional centers. And it didn't work because of basically human nature, be it greed, the, the desire to control, competitiveness, and the silo nature of, of specialties. So that particular recommendation was, was a failure. The second recommendation that I made was that vascular surgery should become more separate from general surgery and cardiac surgery than it then was. Uh, we were a subordinate, subservient subspecialty of general surgery at the time. And I said we had to become more independent and ultimately uh, become a separate specialty. And we made a great effort to that end from 1996 to 2005, uh, applying for an American Board of Medical Specialties independent board. We made a great effort to that extent, and we can talk about some of the details of the history, and we ultimately failed. We did get a primary certificate we did get a zero and five training program, which was our idea, but these were booby prizes. We never got an independent board. And interestingly, the rest of the civilized world has embraced and accepted vascular surgery as a separate independent specialty. But in the United States, we're still a subordinate subspecialty, although there's some things that have been granted to us to make us think we're independent, but we're really not. We can talk more about that uh, if you wish. So the first two recommendations, the work in multi-specialty centers and being an independent specialty, those two recommendations were by and large failures. My third recommendation was successful and that was that vascular surgeons embrace these new endovascular techniques and become adept at performing them. And that was resisted at the time, that is in 1996, by most of the senior leadership of vascular surgery who thought I was crazy when I said that 40 to 70 percent of the procedures that we were now doing by open techniques would become better treated by endovascular techniques. And it turned out, whereas everybody said I was crazy on the high side with that 40 to 70 percent recommendation, I was wrong on the low side because now I think we're between 75 and 90 percent of the lesions that we treat will be best treated endovascular. Thanks for that summary, Dr. V. A lot of our listeners are trainees, either medical students or residents or fellows who are just learning about the whole field of medicine and how we're all split up into these different specialties and picking specialties. So could you step back and just give a bit of a background of how medical specialties are defined and what that really means for those physicians in those groups? Yeah, well, specialties are defined in reality as areas of medicine, which encompass a body of knowledge, technology, and so forth, which makes them different from other specialties. And the physicians who practice them have different skills, training, etc. But in the United States, particularly, and maybe all of North America, well, I'm talking now about the United States, there's an entity called the uh, American Board of medical specialties, ABMS. And that is a self-appointed, self-serving organization which is designed, its own bylaws, to promote better medical care for patients by specialization. And they define medical specialties and they divide them up into what's called approved boards, like cardiac surgery, neurosurgery, orthopedics, GYN, internal medicine, et cetera, et cetera. Vascular surgery, unfortunately, because of its evolution, which we can talk about in more detail, it, it grew out of roots in general and cardiac surgery, has always been a subordinate subspecialty of the American Board of Surgery or general surgery. As time developed, even going back to my 
Darwin talk, it was obvious that there was a conflict between general surgery and vascular surgery because the general surgeons were doing vascular surgery. Many of them were doing it well, but some were not doing it well. And the American Board of Surgery adopted the position that vascular surgery was one of the main pillars of general surgery, and every general surgeon should be qualified or credentialed to practice vascular surgery. And through the 70s and 80s and into the 90s, it became apparent that those with special training in vascular surgery uh, got better outcomes than those who didn't have special training. And that is really what prompted the thrust within vascular surgery to have an independent board where we could control our training. We could determine how many training programs, because we had an attached RRC in vascular surgery, we could determine how many training programs we had or needed or could be qualified. Whereas through the 80s, 90s, and, and even today, the interests of general surgery take priority in some cases over um, the interests of vascular surgery. And where there's a conflict, vascular surgery usually loses. In, in the 80s and 90s, we were obligated to train every general surgeon to do aneurysms and carotids. And there weren't enough cases that we could do that and still train our own vascular surgeons. And most of the general surgeons never did an aortic or carotid procedure. So you can see the conflict there. And again, because general surgery was in the leadership position, the interests of general surgery were better represented and won the day over those of vascular surgery. So that, that sort of ignited the thrust to attempt to get an independent board in vascular surgery. And as I mentioned before, that was an effort that unfortunately failed because of political considerations and to some extent, the power of the American Board of Surgery. Thank you, Dr. Veith. It's helpful to hear your perspective on these issues that are longstanding. Within this same context, can you define vascular surgery for us? And can you explain uh, a little bit more about how it is different and why this would qualify it as its own specialty? Well, it's very interesting. There are bylaws to the American Board of Medical Specialties. And when we submitted our application in 2002, I played a large role in writing that application. We followed the requirements from the bylaws of the American Board of Medical Specialties, ABMS, and we fulfilled all the requirements at that time, this was 1996, to be an independent specialty. I mean, we are the specialty that takes care of all diseases of arteries, veins, and, and lymphatics, although that really isn't a major part of what we do. It's really diseases of arteries and, and veins. And uh, we do the sometimes very difficult and complex procedures to deal with those diseases, fixing aneurysms, taking care of carotid disease, taking care of lower extremity ischemia and various other non-cardiac vascular uh, lesions. And it's obvious that even though we use some of the techniques for general surgery to do our open procedures, even these open procedures are really specialty operations with the need for special training and experience and specialization. If one wants to do a good job with open aneurysm repair, one needs to do a large number of them uh, because they're difficult, complex, and treating them has both morbidity and mortality. The same is true with carotid endarterectomy and with lower extremity bypasses. You need to do 50 such procedures in difficult circumstances to be really good at it. So you add to that the specialization required to do the open procedures, the specialization in terms of training and knowledge and experience to do endovascular procedures. And you really can see where vascular surgery has evolved away from general surgery. Yes, we do have to do laparotomy and thoracotomy to do our open procedures, but there are a lot more details that the general surgeon is not adept at, perhaps, that's required to get good outcomes with the treatment of vascular lesions. 
and then you add the movement away from open procedures to endovascular, and it completely differentiates us from general surgery because general surgery has moved towards laparoscopic procedures, endoscopic procedures, whereas we've moved to endovascular procedures. And the two are really totally separate. There's not much relationship between those. So if you look at the bylaws of the ABMS, we qualify completely as a separate independent discipline, different from general surgery and in fact, different from cardiac surgery, although there are some areas of overlap. And the fact that in 1996, we qualified as an independent specialty by all bylaws, but were turned down for largely political reasons, uh, unfair political reasons. The fact that that occurred in late 1990s and early 2000s, now 12 or 15 years later, with the thrust increasingly towards endovascular procedures for most vascular lesions, it's obvious that we're even more qualified to be a separate independent specialty. The problem is that the ABMS and the ABS are powerful political organizations, and they, for a number of reasons, which I don't think are the right reasons, have chosen not to allow us to become an independent specialty. We can talk about the strategies that they've used to keep us subordinate and the reasons why both in 1996 and today, we as a specialty, that is vascular surgery, suffer somewhat from not being an independent specialty. And Dr. Beath, I just wanted to add something that I've noticed as I've kind of transitioned from my general surgery training over into vascular training is an added skill set, not only making sure I have a, a grasp of certain diseases and the procedures, but an additional skill set is the radiologic interpretation for ultrasounds and for, you know, fluoro studies is, is an additional component and skill set that may not be as much a part of general surgery training that really adds a lot of value to the field. Yeah, you're 100% right. I mean, the, the Darwin analogy is, is it keeps on ticking, that as uh, our knowledge base evolves, as technology evolves, we become even more differentiated specialty. In, in 1996, the problem was general surgeons who were doing one or two carotids or aneurysms a year were getting worse results. So our basic motivation to become an independent specialty was to have one class of vascular surgeon, a competent one. Whereas at the time, <clears throat> 1996, there were two classes of uh, vascular surgeon. One that was well-trained in vascular surgery with a lot of experience, those who had a certificate, and a second inferior class of vascular surgeons, those who just had general surgery training but were deemed qualified or credentialed to do vascular surgery. That was our principal thrust in 1996, that having an independent board would be in the interest of patients, that being the, the goal of the American Board of Medical Specialties to improve patient care by specialization. So we were in the right and they were in the wrong for, in our opinion, for political reasons to deny us this and maintain this two class of vascular surgeon. Today, the reason that general surgeons are doing less and less vascular surgery, as it's become apparent to all that to do it well, you have to have special training. But today, the reason that we need an independent board is that resources within an institution, be it a hospital, a medical school, a healthcare facility, to some extent, based on the leaders in recognized specialties making those decisions or having input. And we as vascular surgeons being a subspecialty, our interests are represented by general surgeons or cardiac surgeons or cardiologists. So we don't get the resources that we might need to optimize our patient care. And that reality would be improved if the playing field were made level and we had independent specialty status along with general surgery so that we would have a seat at the table where resources are distributed. That's one of the main reasons we feel that an independent specialty would be in our interest and our patients' interest. 
and also the RRC in surgery, which controls the number of training programs we have and limits them, I think, somewhat unfairly, that could be corrected because we would have an RRC in vascular surgery as part of our independent specialty status. So, Dr. Veith, I think that you make a strong argument for your view on why, what the benefit is of having a separate board. Maybe you can explain to how this is different than having a vascular surgery board or the American Board of Surgery, which is, I guess, the compromise that ended up happening. It, it's hard for me to be objective and sweet in my answer. But the problem is, you know about politics, the deep state. There are vascular surgeons who get assigned to these sub, whether you call it a sub board, a board, this subordinate board. We have an American Board of Surgery, which is the top level of administration. Under that is a subordinate board, the American Board of Surgery's Vascular Surgery Board, and that board will be peopled by individuals that, for whatever reason, I, I, I don't want to be cruel about this or, or hostile about it, but for some reason, Many individuals on these boards are beholden to general surgery and the American Board of Surgery so that they represent less well the interests of vascular surgery than they do of general surgery. For example, if somebody on the vascular surgery board of the ABS is chairman of a department of general surgery, he obviously has to represent the interests of general surgery in that position. So. It's, in my opinion, somewhat of a ruse to have a subordinate board when we should be, in my opinion, we qualify to be an independent board equal to or on a level with neurosurgery, orthopedic surgery, general surgery, rather than a subordinate subspecialty board, even though the sub has been taken out of the name. Does that answer your question? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Dr. Veith. It's very interesting to hear your perspective on all these political issues um, and lighten things up a little bit. Your John Homan's lecture at the Vascular Annual Meeting in 2016 was uh, entitled, A Look at the Future of Vascular Surgery. What would you say is right and bright, so to speak, about the future of vascular surgery in America? Well, vascular surgery is, has been, and will be a very exciting specialty. We have interesting patients, technically challenging patients. There's a lot of new technology that's uh, on the horizon. So there's a lot of good research uh, topics to evaluate this new technology and compare it with old technology. The operations and the endovascular procedures are gratifying because you save legs. It's a great specialty. There's an abundance of patients. The number of patients has been our population ages, even though medical treatment is good at preventing the ravages of arteriosclerosis, there'll always be a need for interventional or operative procedures to uh, treat the lesions that will still occur despite these improving medical treatments. So it's, it's a really exciting area to be in. And as I mentioned already, and again in the Holman's lecture, we have challenges. One of the challenges being we're in an area where the lesions that we treat can be treated by other specialties. So there's competition for patients, and the competition is very deserving. They've contributed greatly to the field, that is, cardiologists and radiologists. They deserve to treat these patients. But we have to be strong, and one of the challenges is to remain as strong as possible and to increase our strength in numbers to meet these increasing needs for uh, vascular treatment. And um, I think that one of the areas that needs to be addressed is to have a public relations campaign organized by our societies, a big, expensive public relations campaign to inform the public what vascular surgeons are, what they do, and what their assets are. If you go to a cocktail party, and somebody asks you, a layperson asks you, what do you do? You say, I'm a vascular surgeon. They say, oh, you take care of varicose veins or you take care of the heart. And that is not what we do. 
and nobody knows that in the public, or very few people in the public know that, know that. And many medical folk, who are the referring physicians, very few of them know what we do. We're a very strong specialty. We're a huge asset in every institution. We're the firemen that are called in when some other uh, specialty has a vascular injury that they can't control. We're the ones who are called in to control that, and we're unique in that regard as being able to do that. So we need to get out our society, which is well-funded at this point, and all the regional societies need to join forces and mount a very expensive professional campaign to inform the public and referring doctors what is it that a vascular surgeon does, what are the assets that a vascular surgeon brings to patient care and to an institution. We're, we're an unknown specialty. And that, in part, is the fault of our societies not being aggressive enough about mounting such a campaign. So, Dr. Beath, I think this is great advice for the big picture of vascular surgery for the trainees and for people, you know, individuals who are entering this the field or passionate about caring for patients with uh, vascular disease. Any recommendations or advice for the trainees as to what to get involved in or what to pay attention to in order to best advance the field and prepare themselves uh, for the future? Well, uh, in addition to getting the best training possible in both open and endovascular techniques, I think it, it's some, I, I have several grandchildren. And when I talk to them about politics, they, you know, national politics, they say, oh, that doesn't matter to me. I, I can't do anything about it. I'm just a small fry in the ocean. The same is true in vascular surgery. The, the young vascular surgeons and trainees, these political issues or semi-political issues, I can't do anything about it. That's for my gray-haired seniors to take care of. That's a bad mistake because the gray-haired gray seniors have let us down traditionally over the years. That's the main reason we're not an independent specialty. And I think the younger vascular surgeons and trainees have to be aware of these political issues, study the history, read some of the articles uh, on the history of how unfairly we were treated, and make an effort to get involved to persuade your leaders that the time is right to do the things that make our specialty stronger and not worry about some of the pedestrian issues that uh, the vascular societies have traditionally, in my opinion, wasted a lot of time and money on to be engaged primarily in the issues that will strengthen our specialty and make it stronger, more numerous, or able to maintain its status in a competitive world. I recently a year ago, I had a meeting with one of the trainee sessions at our meeting. And when I brought up the subject of some of these political issues, there were maybe 30 young trainees in the room. There was only one person who had any inkling of what we we're talking about. And that people are young, <clears throat> just starting out in training and, and sort of feeling their way into the learning about how to perform the specialty. It has to be involvement uh, and awareness of the bigger issues that are, are going to impact on their careers as those of us who are older fade away and as the younger people become uh, bigger forces in our specialty. So I, I think it's an area that very few trainees and, and young vascular surgeons pay much attention to because they figure they can't do much about it. They They have to rise up and and make the leaders in the specialty listen to the things that are going to be important to the specialty in 5, 10, 15 years. Well, I think that's that's partly why we're so excited to have you on the podcast, actually, Dr. Beath. I think we have a, an audience that uh, is very open to hearing about these things, and, and so this is perfect for us. You know, one of the things we like to ask, and we, we asked this of you in our very first interview, is what is something that's true that almost nobody agrees with you on, but that you know is true? And last year, you mentioned the, the utility of PTFE bypass to the tibial arteries. Is there anything else you can think of along those lines? Well, I'm afraid that this board issue, I'm most certainly a minority, when I make the statement that this is something we badly need and must fight for, there's a general tendency 
within the leadership of specialties not to want to fight, not to, to get involved in, in either hostile actions towards others or even litigation. And I think that that is sadly, I have the minority view, having tried for many years to be conciliatory, play by the rules, be a good boy, a good soldier, it doesn't work. In other words, if you want to change something in any aspect of society, there's going to be intense resistance and you have to be willing to go for it flat out. Uh, if you're going to get involved in a, in a war, you should win the war. And, and to do that requires uh, a lot of fortitude and, and the willingness to fight and take risks. So that's one area where I think I'm in the minority. Regarding the PTFE tibial bypasses, I still think that that's an area most people feel isn't worth uh, pursuing. But we know from not only my experience, but many of my colleagues who have taken the time and energy to do these procedures very carefully, that they do work and they do save legs. And we had one gentleman who had a, a bypass from his common iliac to his perineal artery with PTFE that remained patent to 15 years for just this past year or two ago, but it, it saved his leg for 15 years after multiple previous failures of other uh, procedures. These procedures do work, but very few will accept downsides of doing them because they're usually long and difficult procedures. But when patients run out of vein, PTFE bypasses to tibial arteries can work for long periods of time, and when they fail, you do, do it over. Other areas that where I'm in the minority, I guess, I believe asymptomatic carotid stenosis, by and large, uh, there may be exceptions, but by and large should not be treated either by CAS or CEA. I think I'm a minority opinion holder in that regard. I think medical treatment, I mean, carotid stenosis is rampant in older people with arteriosclerosis. And in general, asymptomatic carotid stenosis is a pretty benign disease. And these patients have other vascular lesions, which will probably do them in, in the heart usually. I think that even in the pre-statin era, we felt that asymptomatic carotid stenosis should rarely be treated by endarterectomy or stent. And yet, most carotid interventions are for asymptomatic disease. I think those patients, intense medical treatment is the way to go for, I'd say, 95 or 98 percent of them. There's an occasional asymptomatic carotid stenosis in a very young, healthy, otherwise patient, which is a rarity that probably, and particularly if there's isolated circulation to the part of the brain supplied by that stenotic carotid, I think maybe an occasional patient should be treated invasively. So those are three areas where I think I'm in the minority, but of course, like everybody, I think I'm right. Dr. V, thank you very much for your uh, views on these uh, controversial topics. Uh, we're all very excited about the upcoming 46th annual VEETH Symposium in New York City on uh, November 19th through the 23rd. Do you have any closing remarks for us? And uh, if you might add, what are you most looking forward uh, to doing once this year's meeting is over? <laughs> That's an easy question. I'm going to start on the next year's meeting, but <clears throat> I do have one, one remark. This year, rather shockingly and surprisingly, knowing my political bent, have decided to form an alliance with TCT, which is the Interventional Cardiology Meeting. And the reason for doing it is that our mission is educational. It's not political with our meeting. I think we can benefit from some of the techniques that the cardiologists know better than we do. A good example being radio access for various interventional procedures. And they can benefit from our views on which patients should be treated and some of the exciting new technology, for example, in lower extremity disease, carotid disease. So our, our hope, and you guys can help us with this, is that we get some interventional cardiologists who come to our meeting as attendees. We have lots of them speaking at our meeting because they're thought leaders throughout the world. But we would like to get some cardiologists, your colleagues in cardiology, particularly in the tri-state area, to come to our meeting for a day or two and learn from it. We think that, that it would be ultimately in the 
interest of better patient care. And you uh, who are listening to this program can suggest these cardiologists take a look at our programs and at the co-branded sessions with DCT and maybe come for a day or two. So that, that would be my request for all of you. All right. well, great. Thank you very much, Dr. Vita. This was a great interview and uh, we're very excited about the meeting. Okay. Well, thank you, Adam, Jake, and Sharif. I enjoy doing this. We are Audible Bleeding. You can find us on all the streaming podcast platforms and at audiblebleeding.com.